title of today's talk is Be a David. And I don't mean a Dave. I mean a David. You know, when I was small, about six or seven, I, uh, when I grew up, I lived in Japan for the first nine years of my life, and I was an American. So I spoke with an American accent <laughs> in an American community in Tokyo. Graham's already started to lose it there. <laughs> and I really was a mom's apple pie young guy, you know? That was great. Mom! It wasn't quite G. Willikers, but almost. Think Richie Cunningham in Happy Days, those of you who remember freckles and stuff. And I remember going to see a friend of mine called Eric, and uh, this chap came out of a car. I guess he was visiting my friend's family. And he said, Hey, your name's David. I was taken aback. I didn't know how he knew my name, but then I kind of reasoned the universe revolves around me, so of course he knows my name. <laughs> your name's David. <laughs> Do you know what that means? My name's David, too. I thought, wow. G. Willikers, or whatever. And I thought, I think I did know what it meant, but I sort of humored him and said, what does it mean? It means beloved of God. And I remember thinking, well, of course it does, because God loves me, because the world revolves around me. So of course God loves me. He owes it to me. And I was disabused of the notion that the universe revolved around me when I was about 19. Um, it's interesting, isn't it? Uh, how when we grow up, we have these sort of very strange notions of who we are, our identity. My mother was American, my father was English, and um, he chose to live in the Far East because business was good out there after the war. And so sometimes we'd visit my mother's family in New York. And I remember one day being arrested by an advert that came, a commercial during the cartoon, Saturday cartoon slot. And it was this. The slogan was, Be a David. It's probably, Be a David. Or something, you know, in a world. And there was this feral-looking guy swinging a sling. And I thought, wow, that's the coolest thing I have ever seen. I want to be a David. I have no idea what it was advertising. Probably insurance or some dull financial product, though why they were advertising that during a kid's cartoon out, I don't know. But it was exciting. And there's suddenly this whole notion of being a David, beloved of God, really came alive for me. And this phrase came to me a few years ago, be a David. It returned to me, and I started mulling it over and thought, hmm, it's a good title for a talk. And I didn't really do much with it. I sat there. It sat on my Evernote sort of um, application for a long time. And uh, it wasn't until recently I read a book. And really, this talk is about part of that book and that book's effect on me. And what I believe God is saying to the church today as well. So there are several applications to what I'm about to talk about. There's the application of what does this mean for me? What does it mean for David Simmons? What does it mean for you? And what does it mean for you all? So you as individuals, but you also as a church, as Lifeline Church today, I have some encouragement for you. I've just finished a PhD. It was good fun. I loved it. And at the end, a little inspiration dropped into my head literally the night before I submitted the thesis. And it was this chart summing up some of my core processes that ran through the thesis. I won't go into the whole detail of it, but basically the key core processes were belonging and identity. If you're going through a difficult time of transition, as my parents were, who I was uh, 
talking about in my thesis, then core processes are belonging and identity in helping you overcome the difficulties that life will throw at you. Okay? So hold on to that. Core processes, belonging, and identity. We'll come back to that in a little while. This is the book, After God's Own Heart. I was um, bought this book for Christmas by one of my sons. I, um, I, I got loads of books at Christmas. I love books. And so I was really excited about it, and I thought, well, I'll put it to one side, and I'll read it, oh, I know, later on. And I thought, no, actually, I'll read it first, and then I'll move on from this one to the next book, which was a, a novel, a really exciting novel that I wanted to read. But this is one of those books that you can't just read and ignore. Well, I couldn't, anyway. It's by a guy called Mike Bickle. Now, to put it in context, Mike Bickle is the leader of the International House of Prayer in Kansas, IHOP, which is also the acronym for the International House of Pancakes. <laughs> so when the Singletons come back from Miami, or where have they been, they will have been introduced to the International House of Pancakes. And apparently they're incredible, so I hear. <laughs> but the IHOP is also the International House of Prayer, and they do 24-7 prayer. And when I first heard of this, I thought, wow, that's committed. 24-7 prayer, what's it look like? And I soon found out, because Toby, our second son, went to live, uh, studied in Durham, finished his degree, got stuck into a church up there called Beth Shan. And Beth Shan is affiliated with Mike's church out in Kansas. And Beth Shan also is working towards doing 24-7 prayer. You can't just jump into it. You kind of have to arrange the processes, the rotors, and all that kind of stuff. But Toby does regular sets. So he'll do a two-hour set. And what a set looks like is people uh, sitting, standing, kneeling, lying, prostrate, whatever, in God's presence, and constant worship as well. So it aims to sort of re echo what's going on in heaven constantly here on earth. And the praying is incredible, and the atmosphere is incredible. And often, in their meetings, kids come in, and they play in God's presence. And there's no, keep those children quiet, none of that. It just, it's very relaxed, very easy come, easy go. Obviously, not necessarily at two in the morning, but although if you've got a baby crying and you want to get out, maybe come to the, the house of prayer. It's not a bad place to go, I suppose, at two in the morning. But it's very interesting how it just, it's a very easygoing thing. And Mike Bickle's been running this now for a very, very long time. And when he said to his sons he was going to set up the house of prayer, they said, why? And he says, because I'm addicted to pleasure. And the greatest pleasure that can be found is the pleasure, pleasure of the presence of God. Before Christmas, John asked me, what do you want to see? What do you want to see God do? And I remember saying, I'd love to see more of the presence of God in Sunday morning meetings. And I got a sense, actually, God was saying, what about every day? Why does it have to be in a Sunday morning meeting? And I thought, yeah, that's a good point. The presence of God in our rooms, in our homes, in our kitchens, in our living rooms, in our attics, if we have such a thing, in our garden sheds. So there's a chapter in this book she talks about five of the seasons of the life of King David. And I wanted to go through those seasons today with you because they spoke volumes to me, and I think they are very key for us as a church as well. It's interesting, the whole thing about chasing after God's heart. It's not something I ever thought I would do quite the way he describes it here. And I'll be quoting from this book from time to time. So just listen to this. What set David apart as a man after God's heart was his unrelenting passion to search out and understand the emotions of God. This, I believe, is the distinguishing factor in the life of any person, you, me, or anyone else, who sets out to have a heart after God's. In fact, the church sometimes 
worldwide will be like David in this regard. So Mike Bickle has a passion to see people experience the power of God in their everyday, mundane, day-to-day, day-in, day-out lives. It can be ours. It doesn't have to be something that was experienced by the great heroes of the Bible. Having said that, we're now going to look at one of the great heroes of the Bible, one of my great heroes, one of your great heroes. Here he is now! Sorry. <clears throat> Don't know where that came from. I, Robin Williams, it sort of comes sometimes. Right, go on. Anyway. <laughs> David was incredible. But I want to wind the clock back 3,000 years ago to a little boy sitting on a hillside, probably bored out of his mind, because David was a shepherd for a long time. First 17 years of his life, he was just a shepherd. And he was the eighth-born son of a man who probably had an awful lot of uh, trials and tribulations in his home with eight kids, a lot of older brothers who were very good looking, charismatic, probably buffed and tanned and really hench. And there was David, weedy one. Kick him out, drop kick him. He can go look after the sheep, that's all he's good for. And so David was kind of the runt of the litter, he was the afterthought. And so he looked after the sheep. What I love about David is that, yes, he was just a shepherd boy. But there was something in him that refused just to be a shepherd boy. Something in him looked up at the stars at night, because shepherds over there, 24-7, it really is. He never went home. They would have brought him food. He would have, he probably would have gone home from time to time, but he would have spent nights out there, days, mornings, The streams, the rivers would have been his background noise. The birds of the air, the sky would have been his canopy. The trees would have rustled and he would have thought, what an amazing sound. He had a poetic mind, David, you see. And whereas his brothers probably looked after the sheep when they were younger, they would have just got bored. But someone taught David the harp. He had a harp, I don't know whose harp it was. But he had this instrument, and he loved to play it, and he loved to get better and better and better and better. And he was actually quite good, because he would attract a crowd when he played and sang. And I know this. We'll come back to that, why he was so well-known. Not only that, he was pretty good with tools. One particular tool was a hemp hook on a long bit of rope, into which he'd put a smooth stone and he'd fling it, whoo, doing target practice and try and hit that tree. Missed, drat, let's try it again. Nah, missed, slightly to the left. Right, I don't know what the sheep thought at this point. I suspect they would have gone, one of them would have gone missing and he would have run after that sheep and left the other 99, fetched it and put it back because he had the heart of a shepherd, of a pastor, And in many ways, he was like Jesus in that regard. Anyway, he was pretty good with the sling, and he was incredible with the harp, and he had an amazing voice. And you know what? He wrote songs. There was something about the cosmos that totally engaged David. He looked up to the stars and thought, God, you are magnificent. And he was a young boy. He was a young boy. Some Bible scholars, and I know Bible scholars are a funny funny breed. You take him with a pinch of salt sometimes. But some believe he actually wrote Psalm 139 when he was a child. I won't go into it, but it's an incredible psalm. Oh God, my God, how majestic is your name in all the earth. He couldn't 
contain praise. He had to explode with praise. He wanted to sing to God. But as far as he was concerned, he was only ever going to be a shepherd. He would have got married, maybe gone to war with the Israelite army, come back, sang his songs in the local pubs and bars, had a family of his own, had a lot of the kids. That's all, that's all his life was going to be. That was it. Just a shepherd boy. Bethlehem is season one. It's the season of shepherding. David lived in Bethlehem. He spent most of his time on a hillside round about the hills of Bethlehem. And his imagery in his psalms were from, often, his shepherd days. So, hiding under God's wings, sheltering from the storms, drinking from God's river. Bethlehem is the season of being faithful in small things. It's the season of being faithful when no one else is looking. And David was faithful. He looked after those sheep. Yes, he got bored and would have mastered the sling and killed two animals in the process. And he probably was pretty good with a knife as well, I would think. But he was also faithful in the mundane stuff. And during the mundane, he would write poetry in his head and he would write songs to God. And sometimes he would actually sing them out. And he would play his harp and people would come just to listen to this shepherd boy sing. And he probably liked the attention. I guess he was a bit of an extrovert as well. So there he is, the boy in Bethlehem. Here we are, you, you are, changing nappies day in, day out, cooking meals day in, day out. The washing never gets done. You have to take it out. You have to put it in. You have to take it out and put it in. Oh, God, this is drudge. And yet in the drudge is faithfulness. And you know who sees? God sees. Bethlehem is the season of being faithful in small things. The most famous man in Israel was a man called Samuel. He was Samuel the prophet. He had anointed King Saul many, many years ago. But King Saul had turned out to be a bit of a bad egg. He wasn't so great. Yes, he was tall and charismatic and bronzed and buff like David's brothers, but he was kind of not all there. There was something not quite right with Saul. And so Samuel goes to Bethlehem, and God says, anoint the next king. I want you to anoint him before you retire. And so Samuel goes to Bethlehem, and he says to Jesse, with his eight sons, God has told me to anoint the next king. Show me all your sons. And Jesse shows Samuel all of his sons. And God says, no, none of them. And he thinks, oh, that was a waste of time. I come all the way here, sacrifice here, and yeah, I have a massive celebration. What do you mean? That's all the sons. Oh, well, there is David. You don't want to see him. He's, he's a shepherd. Okay, bring him. And so Jesse says, all right, go fetch David. He doesn't even go himself. He just says to someone, fetch him. So they go fetch David. And David comes smelling of sheep dung, fingernails gritty with all the dirt of the Bethlehem hillside. Probably hadn't had a shower in weeks. <laughs> oh, well, he would have had a shower. He would have stood under the rain, probably. That was his shower. That was all he was getting. He probably didn't smell great. But God said, that's the one. That young boy has a heart, and I see the sacrifice that he has made. I have seen the years he has spent, 17 years in my presence, and I love that boy, and he is the next king of Israel. Make no mistake, that is the one. And I can't imagine what David's brothers thought. Really? Are you kidding me? Him? He's just the shepherd. But Samuel 
was connected to God. He knew that there was something else going on there. Have you ever received a prophecy long ago and forgotten all about it? Have you ever felt that you were anointed many years ago and God said something special and yet it hasn't come to pass and you've gone back to looking after the sheep and you thought, well, it's never going to happen. It's never going to happen. God wants to awaken your dreams and desires again this morning. He hasn't forgotten you. What does this mean for me? Mike Bickle says, Bethlehem is the place where we learn to find our satisfaction, not in the prophecy or promise, but in God himself. He must be the sole source of our identity. There's that word. Every ounce of David's identity, value, and success was being established in his being loved by God and being a lover of God. Nothing more, nothing less. Sometimes we spend our life looking for identity and belonging in status, in position. We think, I must get that promotion. I must be recognized. I need recognition. Look at all the things, and we justify it biblically. I know, because I read it in a book. Um, I've got all these gifts. I've got all these abilities. Promote me now. But promotion comes from God and no one else. Bethlehem is the place where you discover that your success comes not from what you do, but from who you are in God. Your success comes not from what you do, but from who you are in God. St. Paul says, the God whose I am and whom I serve. Belonging to God in Paul's eyes is much more important than serving God. Serving is very important. It is a natural outpouring of our love for God. It's fantastic. There's nothing like it. Serving in the spirit is one of the most wonderful things. And Jesus did it all the time. The whole thing of washing his disciples' feet. It's actually disgusting if you think about it. What would have been on those guys' feet? (laughs) I don't want to think about it. By the time he got to the 12th disciple, imagine what the water looked like. What was floating in there? Leave it. But it's about belonging first. The God whose I am and whom I serve. What is the significance of Bethlehem for Lifeline Church? Just that we have been faithful for many years. And God has underlined Lifeline with a very radical view of relationships, which is incredibly special, and God sees that. And sometimes we go through stuff and we think, oh, we're so committed, but, you know, we get frustrated or things are hard or people leave or whatever. And God says, just be faithful. Watch because there are good things coming. And I also believe God has rooted a very firm foundation in us as a church and has not always been easy. (laughs) It has not always been easy. So David has been anointed king and he's excited and he's thinking, what does this mean? Wow! (laughs) It actually means going back to the sheep. So he went back to the sheep and he thought, well, that was an interesting interlude. What was that all about? And then one day, not long after, he gets a summons. Now, let me give you some background story. I said King Saul wasn't a very great king. Bless him, he was not. He didn't really have a heart after God. He was kind of dodgy and around the fringes. And uh, he started to have really serious psychotic episodes. And he would just lose it completely. And the one thing they discovered that calmed him down was music. And so what they did was said, send for a great musician, the best in the land. Now, remember I said whenever David played, people would gather. He must have attracted attention because they said, send for David, that harpist on the hillside who looks after the sheep. 
And so David was summoned. Can you imagine going into the king's halls? Now, King Saul didn't really have a palace. He had more of a fortress, a citadel. He was a warrior king. He was the first of all of Israel's kings. So it was all still a bit rough and ready, but he would have been overawed. Imagine this, a 17-year-old boy walking in to the halls, these huge great spears and shields. And so he polished the king's shields and he looked after the weapons and he played his harp and it was incredible. And Saul was chilled by the sound of the harp. It was just the most wonderful thing. And David must have thought, well, I've arrived. Here I am at the king's citadel. Hurrah! And for six years, until he was 23, he spent polishing shields, looking after the bits and pieces in the king's house. Season two is Gibeah. So it looked like promotion. It looked like he'd arrived. He must have thought, I'm in the king's palace, so becoming king must be fairly simple from here, mustn't it? You would think. I, God must have put me here so I could learn how to be, be a good king. So I'll learn from Saul, but Saul's got a family. That's a bit confusing because Jonathan should be the king. Hmm, that's odd. And Jonathan's my best mate. That's really strange because I can't be king because Jonathan will be king. Oh, I'm really confused now. But God has anointed me. Hmm, I'll think about it. And he probably carried on singing his songs and writing his music. Until one day, this guy turns up. And suddenly it all comes into focus. All those years on the hillside, practicing with his sling. Got the tree this time. Woo! I had a chat with Andrew Tizard. Is he here? What a shame, never mind. Had a chat with Andrew Tizard recently. I said, if someone was hit with a force of three kilonewtons on the head, what would happen? Andrew said, well, it would kill them outright. You're not planning to murder anyone, are you? <laughs> I said, no, that's all I need to know. There's a Spanish sling thrower. I don't know his name. Uh, he's on the internet, apparently. And what he does is he slings stones. And he does it as a sort of event, I guess. He's like a, a professional Stone Age Olympian. It's a bit weird, but hey. And apparently these guys are out there. And what they did was this guy, Dr. Mike Edwards, is a trauma surgeon. And he thought, let's measure the force of David's stone. So he got a nine-foot target, like Goliath's size, and put a sensor on it and said, hit that to the Spanish sling thrower and I'm going to measure the force. Three kilonewtons would easily kill a man. The force of that stone, and it broke the sound barrier because it went crack. It was a lovely cracking sound. It must have been very satisfying, actually. 3.62 kilonewtons. Now, I always thought when I read the story that the stone hit Goliath and he fell over and was unconscious. And David killed him by cutting off his head. But no, that force killed him outright. It was a very powerful stone, and he only needed one. Now, you can look at all the sort of metaphors that this tells us about, choosing stones from the river, not stones cut by men, and all the rest of it. There are loads of extra bits of teaching you can get out of this. But I just want to go for the big one. It killed the man. And that was it. He was incensed. You see, David had a heart after God, and he heard this Philistine mocking God, and he couldn't take it any longer, and he got a sling. Now, Saul tried to get him fulled up in armor. He thought, I'm going to lose my harpist, but that's tough. That's tough. He's, he's, he's got a passion. He wants to deal with this thing. Let's give him a go. So send him out there. And suddenly, boom, Goliath is dead. David takes Goliath's own sword, cuts off his head, and things change from there. There's a little Middle Eastern sling thrower. And this is a guy in the American Stone Age Olympics. Don't ask. And here's a picture I couldn't resist. 
Now, tell me what's wrong with this picture. Anyone see? Well, it's foreshortening. I, I like to think there's actually probably a lot more space there. You see, it's, it's a sort of a particular lens of the camera, so it looks close. But anyway, what's wrong with that picture? Any ideas? Goliath actually had a helmet on. But just below, boom, the stone went. Unbelievable. David became, overnight, a superstar. It was like winning the lottery, Britain's Got Talent, Pop Idol, and X Factor all rolled into one. He was the star of the moment. And girls, teenage girls, started singing songs about him. Saul has killed his thousands, and David's killed his tens of thousands. Da, 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 Hey! And people were dancing in the streets, and the Philistines were routed, and everything was wonderful. And Saul became insanely jealous. Bless him, he wasn't a well man. He just lost his rag. And one day... David was playing his harp. David was fairly chilled. I don't know how, if, whether it went to his head. I trust not. Anyway, he was just playing his harp, minding his own business, and boom, a spear hits the wall next to him, and he thinks, what was that? Saul, oh, it's just a bit of target practice. What a shame I missed. And he thought, I was not good, but okay, I'll give him the benefit of the doubt, and he's playing his harp a couple of weeks later, and whoom! He's dodging another spear. Just a bit of target practice, David. Just a bit of target practice. <laughs> David thought, there's no coincidence there, and he spoke to his, bro uh, his um, best friend, Jonathan, who was Saul's son, and said, I think your dad's trying to kill me. Saul said, no. He's a nice bloke, my dad. No, I think he's trying to kill me. And they set up a little ruse, a little plan, and the plan unveiled the fact that, yes, Saul was trying to kill David. He was insanely jealous. And so suddenly the great superstar who thought his time had come had to escape. And sometimes fleeing from danger can be the best thing we do. If anyone's read the amazing story of O oh, Heavenly Man, Brother Yun, I don't know if you've read that book, it's incredible, can't recommend it highly enough. He escapes quite a lot because he just gets the opportunity to escape from danger. What did Saul do when David escaped? He recruited 3,000 of his best trained soldiers to look for David and kill him. 3,000 people whose sole purpose in life was to kill one man. That is some serious pursuit. So one minute he's a superstar, the next minute he's fleeing for his life. And thinking, oh boy, I don't know what happened there. 23 years old and he's escaped to season three. Adullam. The cave system of Adullam. Adullam's more than just a cave, it's a whole cave system. It's quite an incredible place, actually, if you look at it. It's still there on the internet. You can see it, and I've got a picture in a minute. Adullam means refuge, and it was a, a refuge, but it was also a season of great difficulty for David. He had a bunch of people around him now, a load of malcontents and ne'er-do-wells, who were really quite wild because they had debts that needed settling. They all hated Saul for some reason. And David's job... He had two very difficult jobs. One was to stay hidden from Saul, and the other job was to stop his men and all their families from going out and killing Saul's people because he wanted to try and keep the peace. And they were feral. They were kind of wild. They were also the fearsome, ugly warriors that John likes to talk about. And gradually over time, they turned into a crack force of soldiers, very powerful, brilliant soldiers. But at this time, they were crazy. 
And this is a Dulham. Quite a cool place, isn't it? This is one of the many cave systems. And people, there are whole sort of rooms and places where people can uh, get sort of sunshine, but also you could crawl into there and hide and all that sort of thing. A Dulham for David, he was only there a few weeks, months maybe. He then went to another place, then another place, then another place. He had to move around. So a Dulham was a season for him of hiding, of keeping low, of not being seen. It was a very, very narrow place. And there's a lovely story where David is in a cave and Saul turns up in the cave. And it's like, hello, this is the most amazing thing. And Saul comes to do a poo because he's a human being. Yes, he's king of all Israel, but he also has to, you know, answer the call of nature. So Saul sits down, takes off his robe. David thinks, right, now's my chance, but I'm not going to take it. I'm just going to tease Saul. So he cuts off a bit of his robe. And all his men say, you're crazy. You've been anointed king. Go get it. Slit his throat. And everyone will rejoice, because not many people liked Saul by this point. He wasn't a very popular king. Get his army on your side, and you'll become king of Israel. Just like that. David said, ha, ha, ha. I'm not going to do it that way. See, David had a heart after God. He wasn't going to cheat his way or fight his way in the wrong sense to promotion. He was going to do it in God's time. So he was still at his lowest ebb. And he says to Saul, when Saul finishes, he says, hey, recognize this? So he's standing on a promontory and Saul is down there. And they, David, he said, yeah, this is a bit of your robe. I could have cut your throat, but I chose just to cut your robe. I just want you to know, you might be wanting to kill me, but I'm not wanting to kill you. And Saul wept and cried, David, my son! Because he kind of felt like a son to him at some points earlier on. I am so wicked, said Saul. I'll go away, I won't bother you again. Thank you, says David. But he kept an eye out, and of course Saul came back with even more men next time to kill him. So he was a bit of a funny bloke, so he really wasn't very well. God doesn't want us to get our identity even a little bit from our anointing or earthly success, but rather from being loved by God and being a lover of God. So David gave up. He spent seven years in the season of Adullam the narrow place. And when I say he gave up, it's an interesting one because he gave up trying in his own strength, but he used his strength to go fight Israel's enemies from a Philistine town. It was really crazy, called Ziklag. So the Philistines liked him by this point. They thought, you know, he's actually a really good guy because King Saul hates him. We like him. So they gave him a city to live in. And he and all his wives and all his men and their wives and all the livestock, they all inhabited the city of Ziklag. And from Ziklag, he would go out and raid. And the Philistines thought he was raiding the Israelites, and the Israelites didn't know where he was. And David was actually raiding the Israelites' enemies. But he wasn't in a good place. He wasn't living in God's fullness for him. He was kind of not really fulfilling the dream. And one day he's out raiding, and his men says, there's smoke in the horizon. He goes back, follows the smoke, and his whole city is on fire. And all his men's families, all his families, all his livestock have all been taken away. So someone lured him out and burnt his city and captured all his family. And he comes to God in repentance because he'd been sort of living without God for a while and trying things in his own strength. And he says, God, will I be successful if I run after the the people who've taken all my family and all the livestock? And God says, go, you're going to be successful, and they're all going to be fine. So David goes. And because he's following after God's purpose and not his own, he is successful. And all these people get gathered around. He rescues his family 
all the livestock. Not a one hair of their head has been harmed. And he's absolutely delighted. You can imagine David comes back rejoicing and all his men, who at that point were about to kill him because all their families had been kidnapped, they're delighted as well. So everyone's happy. And at that point, David hears the news. King Saul has been killed in battle. There is no king in Israel anymore. Well, there kind of is, but so many of David's family, oh, so, many, so, so many of Saul's family have been killed, there's not many of them left. So David inquires of the Lord again. He asks God, is it now time for me to be king? God says, no, not time. And so David comes out of the narrow place into the broad place, but he doesn't take hold of everything that God has for him at that point because it's not yet time. Rather, he becomes king of Judah, one-twelfth of his promised inheritance. But this is a very important season. He goes to the city of Hebron and sets up a palace and learns to be a king. He wasn't after power, success, a title of recognition. He was after God's heart. And God said, stay in Hebron, be king of Judah. And as far as he was concerned, that's, that was good enough because God had said it. God also wanted David's army, his mighty men, to become loyal and mature. So there was a whole lot of stuff to still learn in Hebron. That was where he learned to rule. That was where his men learned to obey him. Our greatest private agenda, however, must always be to be loved by God and to love God. And David had gone through these seasons of trial and tribulation in order to rule, but rule from a position of humility before God. He always knew that he was king only because God had made him king. That, you see, Saul had become king and thought it was his right. He grabbed hold of everything with both his hands and tried to keep a hold of it and failed. Whereas David was chilled because he'd learned to be mature in the difficult times, in the narrow place. He'd really struggled in the narrow place. But he'd come to the broad place of Hebron. Does that sound familiar? What does Hebron mean for the church? It's a new place of rulership, learning new things, a new sense of the favor of God, learning to rule, learning to make mistakes in rulership, government. We're living in vibrant and exciting times. We're seeing long-term battles finally coming to an end. But we're only just beginning. We're learning what it means to rule in the power of God. We're learning not to rush, but to wait for his word. And sometimes that means seeing something really cool that we want to do, but saying, no, actually, we won't do that because it's not for us to do. And finally, one of Saul's final relatives was killed, and the time came for David to rule in Zion, in Jerusalem, in the city of David. He was 37 years old. How old was he when he was anointed? Who remembers? 17. 20 years. 20 years. 20 long, hard, difficult, troublesome years. He ruled over all Israel from Zion, the fifth season of David's life. However, there were fresh battles to be fought. The season of Zion, looking after the whole of Israel, was not easy for David. He still had a lot of struggles, a lot of personal battles. But he fought those battles from a place of security, a place of knowing who he was 
under God the Father. He had a very mature relationship with God by this point. Even when he sinned catastrophically, bless him, he still wrote one of the most beautiful psalms. Create in me a clean heart, O God, and renew a right spirit within me. Cast me not away from your presence, O God. Take not your Holy Spirit from me. Restore unto me the joy of your salvation and renew a right spirit within me. David was all about God. And I actually believe if someone had come to him, if the prophet Nathan had come to him and said, you know, David, you've now ruled Israel for however long. It's time for you to go back to the hillside and look after sheep again. I reckon he would have been happy with that. Because that was where he first learned to love God and to serve God and to honor God. So as you prepare to enter your destiny, you need to set your expectations correctly. Yes, you will inherit good stuff, but there will be battles. But remember, it is a journey. Blessed are those whose hearts are set on pilgrimage. As they pass through the valley of despair, they make it to a place of springs. The autumn rains also cover it with pools. They go from strength to strength until each one appears before God in Zion. Psalm 84, verses 5 to 7. It's one of the psalms that defines us as a church and shows us that we are on a journey. It's exciting. But as soon as we think we've arrived, God disabuses us of that notion. So what does that mean for me personally? I believe God is calling each one of us to step up into a fresh understanding of what it is to know him as a father and to serve him on a daily basis, but more importantly, to know him. God is calling us. You can easily live your life as a Christian on autopilot. You can easily think, yeah, God loves me. I love God. Let's enjoy the worship on a Sunday. Let's enjoy being part of the whole thing, the church thing. It's amazing. You get to go to meetings. You get to meet new people, reach people, run coffee shops. What's more to love? Oh, uh, yeah. There's a little note about the coffee shops I'll bring maybe later. But you can't do it on autopilot. And I think God is challenging. He certainly challenged me. He said to me when I read this book, he said, so what does that mean for you? For me, it means on a fairly regular basis, not necessarily every day, but most days, sitting in front of my desk on the floor. I like sitting on the floor. Not kneeling. That's a bit difficult for my knees at the moment. But I sit on the floor and I just contemplate God and I say, here I am. God is teaching me to be still. Those of you who know me will know how hard that is for me. But for me, that's what he's teaching me. David, just be still. Just sit in my presence. Enjoy the power of my Holy Spirit. Listen to my voice. And enjoy the sunshine that my presence brings. I tell you, it's like nothing else on earth. He's teaching us, teaching me, how just to sit. Now, of course, there's stuff to learn, there's stuff to do. And I have a to-do list every day, 25 items long of more. It's not about that, it's about me. Let me be enough for you. And it was a challenge for me but I wouldn't want to do anything else. And it's not for very long, 20 minutes maybe. Sometimes I sing in the spirit. I sing a lot, actually, and I think that's okay. I have an unplugged electric guitar, and I twang the strings. I sing my songs to God. Because when I first became a Christian, I was a fairly obnoxious guy, very intense. And Amanda still met me, fell in love with me, and married me in spite of that. Um, but one of the things I did was I used to sing quietly to myself in my room all alone 
just me and God. And I would worship God and I would sing songs to him. Songs that I'd written, songs that other people had written. Learn to play my instrument. And God's taking me back to that. My identity and belonging being wrapped up in him. No hidden agendas. It's easy to think, if I sit in God's presence, I will receive his power. And then I'll be able to go and pray for people in the park and see them healed. And God's supernatural power will come. Well, God's supernatural power will come. Is here. But it's not about that. (laughs) It's not about my ministry. It's not about being a singer or writing musicals. Any of those things. You see, we sing a song. I want to know you. I want to seek your face. And God is singing at the same time, I want to know you. I want you to see my face. Now, how can the God of all the universe who knows everything know me any more than he already knows me? That's one of those puzzles, isn't it? He knows everything, but he still says, I want to know you. He wants us to open up our hearts to him. He wants us to be transparent before him. Every part of our character, of our mind. Mark was talking last week about being transparent, opening everything up, and the release that that brings. It's awesome, but it costs. What does it mean for you? What changes will you make to your daily routine to seek God with all your heart? Because that's the first commandment. Love the Lord with all your heart, all your soul, and all your spirit, and all your mind, and all your other. And love your neighbor as yourself. So, what does that mean? At the end of today's meeting, I want to pray for all of those who want a fresh touch of that intimacy with God. Who want to experience the love of God afresh in your life. What does it mean for the church? About 18 months ago, just as it was turning into autumn, I was saying, don't look at the signs out there. The leaves are falling off the trees. It's turning autumn. Soon it will be winter. But God is saying, spring is coming to the church. Well, it's here. The open place, the broad place, is spring. The manifestations of God just through worship alone is spring. The power of healing that we have seen, literally a foretaste of, is spring. But there is more to come. What do you think summer's going to look like if this is spring? (laughs) Hey? Mark's got a little thing he likes talking about, Pile Up Sunday. He said, I can't wait one day. So so many people are totally out in the presence of God that we have to pile them up one by one like a bunch of pancakes. <laughs> Maybe that's coming. Maybe that's what summer looks like. Longing to see powerful supernatural healing. Longing to see deliverance. Longing to see transformation of people's circumstances from darkness to light. Longing to see these things. I can't wait. And it's coming. And it's here. But there's more to come. Welcome to the season of Hebron for the Lifeline Church. We're not at Zion yet. We're in Hebron, though. God is saying, we are now learning to rule in government. And I think this is a significant time. I don't think it's a coincidence that there's an election coming up soon. Don't know what that means. But the spirit, in the spirit, I'm sensing... We are entering a new place of rulership as a church where our faithfulness in the small things will be rewarded in the big. But it will be a twelfth of what God has for us. We'll learn to rule. We'll learn to obey authority like David's mighty men had to do in Hebron. So, are you going to take hold of what God has in this spring season?
What does it mean to be a David? It means warfare. We will have battles and we can expect victory because we are warring from the open place. We are at the right-hand side of God. We are seated in heavenly places, Paul says. It's a powerful place to be. Are you living in the fullness of what it means? The season of Hebron means, as a church and as individuals, we learn what it means to live in heavenly places. We're going to learn what that actually means. And occasionally we'll fall flat on our faces. It, it'll happen. But great, people who fail are doing so much more than those who aren't even trying. So let's go out there. Let's try and see what God has for us. Let's take risks. It means worship taking us to a new level of Davidic corporate worship. We had teaching on worship ooh, a long time ago now from Davy Cop. We're going to start entering into more of that. It's a significant time, too, for the children because I think they will learn to take us to new places in the spirit realm. And so I believe we need to listen very carefully to what the children have to say. It means intercession. You know, some of you will say, I want more of God's spirit. And God says, okay, there you go, boom, and you will be broken. But it's a fantastic breaking because you break with the heart of God and he gives you your, his heart for intercession so that you know how he feels about the lost. And that is a very powerful thing. And finally, government, leadership. What that will look like, I can't say. We're already tasting bits of it with faith action and stuff like that. It may not mean worldly government, but it will mean something very powerful indeed. It may mean government in heavenly places. So Hebron was the place where David learned to rule, and this is where we are now as a church. It's a very exciting place to be. At the same time, I want you to start dreaming dreams. What does spring look like? What does summer look like? These amazing seasons God has for us as a church. What will it look like? Start dreaming dreams. Start talking in your groups about this. For those of you who want to know more intimacy, I want to pray with you for your personal walk with Jesus because that's all it's about. You know, when you die... When my dad died a few years ago, I looked at him laid out on the bed, and it wasn't him, and I realized what death was. It's a, it's a passing, but my dad had, had moved on, and this is important because you realize that you may own so many things, you may have so many titles. I can call myself doctor, but it means nothing, really. But ultimately, it's about me and him. That's all that matters.